everybody, welcome back to um, our webinar. Today's topic is MSP instruments, so marine spatial planning. What kind of instruments are available to us as planners to do MSP? So here's a quick run through the presentation, what I'll be talking about. First of all, just a short uh, clarification on what do we actually mean by instruments. Then we'll have a quick look at the MSP cycle because different instruments are likely to come into play at different stages of that cycle. And then really my plan is to run you through a few examples of instruments, some that are very common, that are used by MSP far and wide, and those are the stock take, which happens very early in the MSP cycle. Then I'd like to talk a little bit about visions and objective setting then about analysis, how we actually move from mapping, for example, from the stock take to actual planning. Then there's a section that takes a look at what I've called the spatial management toolkit. So a whole series of different things that are at the disposal of planners or managers um, to then do some of these um, MSP things. Then very briefly, because there's been a separate webinar on that topic, just very briefly touching upon stakeholder engagement. And last not least, I want to say a few words about scenarios as another very useful instrument or MSP tool. And then just to close, um, touching upon some other aspects and to wrap things up in a conclusion. MSP instruments. What does that mean exactly? And I've put here um, a definition from the Cambridge Dictionary. There it tells us that the instrument is a tool or another device that is used for performing a particular piece of work. Or as an alternative, an instrument is a way of achieving or causing something. And that's actually a very appropriate definition because here in the MSP context, I'd like to use the term instrument in both of these senses. So it's really a tool or an approach or um, some means that is employed to actually do MSP. Really the different ways that we have of achieving MSP goals and also the very specific tools, the very specific approaches that planners might use to accomplish part of the MSP cycle, a particular task. For example, engaging stakeholders in a event or something like that. Let's have another look at the MSP cycle. And I'm sure you've um, been become familiar with that through some other presentations already. So the MSP cycle really can be considered as an instrument in itself because it is a way of structuring the process of drafting a plan and making sure that it's implemented and then evaluated. But then when we look at that cycle, it's fairly obvious that different types of instruments are likely to be needed at different stages of that cycle. And we could maybe as a first stage differentiate between a large scale instruments and the more detailed instruments that maybe only apply during one of those um, stages. So, for example, stakeholder involvement. You can see here in this particular cycle, the stakeholder perspective being at the centre of it all, implying that stakeholders really play a role all the way through the MSP cycle. So stakeholder involvement as an instrument likely to come into play at different stages all the way through. There are many more specific tools that facilitate that involvement and there are different types of stakeholders, different types of involvement that are important at some of these different stages. So you can see the larger scale, the more generic definition of an instrument and the much more specific, smaller scale to actually then do the job, the specific job or the specific task at hand. This here is another example, and I think you have seen this in another webinar. Again, the planning cycle, this time also you can see stakeholder engagement at the centre, very important all the way through. This one depicts uh, the strategic environmental assessment as an instrument, and you can see this comes in at different points of that particular cycle um, for different purposes. So SEA, can also be considered an instrument in MSP. So here again, the IOC UNESCO, the step-by-step -step approach to MSP. It's not a cycle, it's more of a flowchart in this case. 
And I'm showing it really only, again, to zoom in to the nitty gritty of what it means to do MSP at those different stages. And you can see just by looking at this diagram, different tools, different instruments are going to play a role um, at different points of this flowchart. So let's zoom into some of these instruments, some of these tools in a little more detail. So the first instrument I'd like to talk to you about is the stock take. So the stock take is really the first step you would take if you were to draft a marine spatial plan. And it's really taking stock, which means you look at everything that's going on in your planning area to see what's the picture, what's the current picture that you are dealing with, What's the starting point, really, the current situation? So you might be looking also then at the range of activities that's happening in the sea space. And you might be looking at the drivers behind these activities, policy targets, for example. You might want to look at trends that are expected in the next 10 years or 20 years with these maritime sectors in your planning area. And of course, you doing this because you are wanting to find out well, what might be conflicts that my plan has to deal with. What are perhaps the incompatibilities that one needs to take into account when drawing up the plan? So that's really the very first stage, the stock taking stage. So here are some examples then within that broader stage of MSP of some specific instruments that are available to planners. One is um, to actually look in more detail at the trends and also the dynamism that key maritime sectors are experiencing. And here's an example from uh, the Bolsi Plan project, a report that was done to do exactly that. So it picked out some of the activities, some of the sectors that were important in the planning area, and it looked at how dynamic developments in those sectors actually are. And you can see that there's been a rating for the current dynamism. Two pluses means it's fairly dynamic. One plus means not really so dynamic. And you can see the explanation, the development expected up to 2030 in that case, and have been written down for each of these sectors and to explain exactly what this dynamic consists of. And you can see, for example, the case of offshore wind farming is a good example. Back in 2011, there was um, the prediction of significant growth of the total amount of megawatts that offshore wind was supposed to produce. And that then translates into uh, a considerable need for sea space in order to do offshore wind farming to accommodate that dynamism and those trends. So you see the idea. It's, it's a fairly simple tool at the end of the day, and it's just a a nice summary way of depicting what's going on in the sectors and also what to expect into the future, because MSP really is all about the future. It's not about the present so much. And you can then translate those kinds of analysis into more specific analysis of trends, of pressures, the implications that this has, and then, of course, also the relevance. How is MSP going to respond to some of these trends and pressures? And here are some examples from the same project, from the Bolsi Plan project. Uh, one of the trends, for instance, being a growth in container passenger and oil transport, so expansion of shipping. That then translates into increased shipping frequency, but also larger ships, maybe more feeder traffic, maybe also a greater risk of accidents happening because of that greater density of ships. Policy responses that are often called for then say, well, in order to accommodate more ships, we need more port facilities. We need to consider intermodal transport chains nowadays. There's also uh, the risk of pollution coming from a greater risk of accidents. And how is it relevant to MSP? Well, MSP, being an area-based tool, can respond, for example, by calling for traffic separation zones or by installing safety zones around fixed installations like offshore wind farms in order to minimise those risks of increased accidents. So you get the idea of this kind of a tool. It's really just an analytical framework and a systematic way of actually looking at trends translating those into spatial implications and then separating 
the overall policy responses and the relevance, the specific response MSP might be able to give. Another tool is to analyze policy objectives and legislation more specifically as well, all still during that first initial phase of MSP when you're trying to build that picture of what's going on, what's really happening, and also what's the room for maneuver that I actually have as a planner because of these national objectives that have already been set and also because of existing legislation. That legislation, remember, has probably predated MSP it exists is something that we need to take into account. And the same goes for international objectives and environmental objectives. And I'm showing you this example, which is from Sweden. It's from the current status report from 2014. And it's again, a systematic way of analyzing national and international policy objectives and the all important legislation as a basis for then considering planning objectives. And you can see the planning objectives in the middle there because the intention is to bring all those various strands together, of course, in MSP being an integrated management tool. What else are um, instruments and tools to be using during a stock take? Well, of course, it is mapping. It's, it's trying to depict existing uses. And that's not a great surprise, of course, Here's an example from the German North Sea, from the EEZ, and it depicts the current licenses that have been awarded for sand, gravel, oil and gas extraction. So these are existing uses and those are um, activities that are, have already been granted permission. So MSP is really having to deal with those as part of planning ahead for the future. Some more examples from the German North Sea, from the German EEZ looking at shipping, looking at defence activities, that's the right-hand picture with the grey areas, and also, of course, um, conservation areas. The green ones shown here are existing nature reserves, or green, well, marine protected areas, effectively. So those are really helping you to build that picture of what's already going on, what are the existing uses happening in the planning area. And on top of that, it's always worth looking at planned uses. And again, mapping like this is really helpful. Same example, same planning area. These are planned offshore wind farming sites. This is the site development plan, so a sector plan, not a marine spatial plan. It's just the one sector planning how it would like to use a marine space in the future. And these are the areas that have been chosen, have been dedicated for the development specifically of offshore wind. But that's already forward looking. It's looking, I think it might be a 10 year um, strategic plan, but I may be wrong there. So, but anyway, the point is it's forward looking. These are uses that do not yet exist as such in the sea. And then a stock take map brings it all together really. This one is a fairly old one, it's from 2018. And it shows you the picture um, that you get when you overlay all these various existing uses. And you can see there's a lot really going on. And it's likely to be that case for many different sea areas um, around the world. There's actually probably more going on than we uh, are giving ourselves credit for. So it helps to produce these stock take maps just to get a good overview picture. This is another version of a stock take map. It's an online version. Um, Denmark is the first country, I believe, in Europe that has gone for a fully online MSP process. And accordingly, you can choose your own stock take maps um, from the online portal. You can choose the layers that you see. You can zoom in and you can also overlay different layers in order to get the full picture. So that's just a difference really between a printed or a PDF map and one that you can kind of build yourself almost through an online portal like that. And obviously, one of the purposes of doing uh, the stock take is, is to determine, well, OK, now we know what's going on, but what really are the key planning needs? Are we really dealing with crucial conflicts that require MSP to step in? What are the sectors and where are those hotspot areas for planning? Moving on to the next instrument. Um, a very useful one and one that's also uh, frequently employed in MSP context is visions and objectives. Now, the vision is crucial because the vision is really the forward-looking guide, I would say, 
that gives you direction and really describes what are we actually planning for? Where do we really want to be in 20 or maybe even 30 years? And what do we need to do today in order to get closer to that overarching vision for the sea? So here's a definition of what's a vision. It really is a way of setting out the preferred evolution or the preferred end state of marine developments over the course of a certain time frame, which has been agreed on in general lines, either only among those who have developed a vision or ideally in the case of MSP, together with the stakeholders. So the vision, as I said, that's really the forward looking, the guiding framework, which can then be supported by a more precise or a more dedicated strategic action plan, for example, or a roadmap, which then sets out those steps that need to be taken in order to achieve that longer term vision. So that would be where you'd say, OK, well, who actually needs to do what? What are the actions that are going to take us there? And here is a definition again of the strategy that might underpin the vision. So again, a strategy is still a fairly broad instrument. It's not going to go into the nitty gritty of who needs to do exactly what at what point in time. It's really a sort of broad brush outline of, OK, this is what needs to happen. These are the objectives we are setting ourselves. And of course, ideally, a strategy should contain specific objectives ideally supported by indicators so that it's possible to track progress, so that it's possible to know where are we actually in that strategic implementation process. And here on the picture, just a few examples of some of the strategies that are around. So please feel free to have a look at those, to Google them. It's really worth looking at them just to get a feeling for what this kind of document is like, what the kind of document is trying to do. And just to complete the picture, the action plan, again, and think of it as a kind of flow chart going from the vision through a strategy, through a concrete action plan. Now that would then be where you'd specify those actions that are going to get you to the strategy and ultimately the vision. It would set out to the responsible actors what they need to do. Now here the definitions sound very much like it's always clear cut, but of course in practice very often things like visions, strategies, action plans are actually mixed or come together in a single document. So for example, the US Air document, it's a strategy really which includes a vision and an action plan. Or the VASAP LTB strategy is also a strategy with elements of an action plan. So really, it's a matter of definition. It doesn't really make that much difference at the end of the day, but it might be helpful also um, to be precise um, in terms of what is what, what you call what at the end of the day, because it really achieves greater clarity both for yourself and also for any stakeholders. And I've also put the concept of a roadmap there just to illustrate that this is yet another more detailed kind of timed um, approach um, which specifies milestones and specific timelines. So just to bear those um, differences in mind, but also bear in mind that very often they come as part of a single document, a part really of a single instrument, which is called something like visioning or objective setting and something along those lines. Let's look at the next range of instruments. And this is really where we move from the descriptive part of MSP to the more analytical parts of MSP. So this is really where you'd take the map, where you'd take all the various assessments you've done and actually move from that data, from that information to the planning logics. So that would be for example, stakeholder input that you have collected. You know now which areas might be important in the planning area for, for which sectors. You have determined possibly also where, where conflict areas lie, also where potential synergies might lie between the sectors, between sea use. You might also have had a look at cumulative impacts or the pressures that the various uh, marine uses are having. So now really you're thinking, well, okay, 
How does that then translate into a plan? How can I guide these developments in the sense of a vision that perhaps uh, already exists or in the sense of sustainable marine development? So various instruments to have a look at. The first one is a so-called compatibility table. And you might have come across this before. It's really a way of analysing which activities in the planning area are compatible with which other activities in that same planning area. It's important to uh, remember that this is looking at spatial compatibility. So the question is, which activities can happen at the same time in the same space without interfering with each other in a negative way? So here is an example, and you can see that basically it's a fairly simple table which puts all the various uses against each other and then spend some time either with expert support or as a planning team or with the stakeholders that would be the ideal way of doing this to consider well okay what's actually going to be compatible with what can we really have offshore wind farms in the same place as cables in the sea can fisheries, for example, really coexist with marine protected areas? Can mariculture, for example, go with tourism in the same area? Or can you have a harbour and a port area in the same place as tourism? And it's very likely that different stakeholders, different experts, different people are going to come to slightly different assessments of these compatibilities. And it's very likely that there's going to be a fair amount of discussion about this. It's also likely that perhaps a more detailed table is required, one that doesn't actually talk about tourism as such, but specifies which kind of tourism. Are we talking about boating or diving or angling or any other type of recreational activity? So there are different ways of actually doing this, but the principle is always the same. It's looking at area-based management. It's looking to find out how can I arrange these different activities, these different uses in my planning area so that there's least conflict between them. And if conflict is unavoidable, if there simply cannot be a solution that accommodates everything, well, how do I achieve a trade-off? But at least based on this table, you know where the most important incompatibilities are going to be. So spatial compatibility tables, spatial compatibilities, that's a really useful instrument. And that leads on to a more detailed conflict analysis. And here's an example. Um, it really stems from that kind of table that we saw before. And it's really looking um, a little more precisely at the conflict that emerges. It's looking and at it in a more descriptive way, for example, and explains also, you know, what exactly the conflict amounts to. What exactly is in conflict here? And then from that description, of course, it's possible to think or to start thinking about potential solutions. It's also a useful way to find out, do we need more information? Do we have all the data that we need in order to determine if something is really conflicting or not? And is there perhaps a supposed conflict which really at the heart of it is only a competing interest? Or in the ideal case, is coexistence possible? So it's that kind of initial analysis combined with a more descriptive part to, to really try to understand the heart of the conflict. We really be precise about this. What exactly is this conflict all about in order to move forward with any planning options? Another instrument, a very, very important one already alluded to, is cumulative impact assessments. And here's an example from the Adriatic. And the purpose of cumulative impact assessment is to really try and look at all the various activities, all the various pressures in a sea area in combination. So one way of doing it is to actually put them all on top of one another, to overlay them on their maps. And you can see here the examples of transport, oil and gas extraction, there's tourism, there's trawling, there's fishing, there's a lot going on in the Adriatic Sea. So you put them all on top of one another in order to then determine, well, what are the pressures? What do those activities then translate to in terms of pressures? 
pressures now are different from activities uh, and are, for example, then litter that uh, affects the marine environment, or underwater noise, or inputs of organic matter, or abrasion. So it's really then already talking about the impact of all these activities uh, on the marine environment on the sea. And from that, you can then distill out the more important, more precise environmental components. So where is this having an impact? Which are the habitats that are um, affected by these pressures? So you can differentiate, for example, here between important nursery habitats or where marine mammals uh, like to congregate or seabirds or turtles or lots of different habitats and species that are um, the recipients, so to speak, or are affected by these pressures. And from that, it's possible to come up with sensitivity maps, which then lead to a cumulative impact assessment. So really a way of describing where are the human activities causing the greatest degree of pressure and where then is that pressure having the greatest impact because maybe of sensitive environments, because of sensitive species. And to depict that on a map is a really useful instrument. It's a very useful way of visualising uh, these impacts that uh, marine activities are having in a planning area. And there's lots of different tools that are being developed or have been developed um, in order to help do cumulative impact assessments. Um, one of which is a Swedish tool, it's called Symphony, but there's many others also available um, and it's possible to have a look at them to check them out. So here is just um, a few more maps, a few more snapshots really of doing such cumulative impacts and going from the mapping of activities to assessing pressure, adding up the various activities and then considering how are they impacting the marine environment and also each other potentially. So from that kind of assessment, the next step is to ask, well, OK, now we really understand the planning area pretty well. So how can we then identify good places for certain activities um, and perhaps, you know, not such good places for some of them as part of the marine spatial plan? So this is really where the various spatial and temporal management measures come into play. So this is really where MSP becomes MSP. So here we have all the various tools that allow you to set spatial priorities to actually separate activities in space and then to sort of um, also guide these activities into the future. And you can see the list of uh, tools that are available um, at different levels, also different spatial levels. So here is the classic planning tools that marine spatial planners would be using, and that would be to define um, priority areas or reservation areas or maybe suitable areas or perhaps also just a generic, a general use area. So the priority area is usually the one that is clearest in assigning priority to a certain activity and other activities usually are only allowed in such areas if they do not interfere with the priority activity. The reservation area also gives um, priority to some degree. It gives a certain weight to particular uses or combinations of uses, but isn't quite as explicit. It's not as strong as a priority area. It's more of a weighing up still of different activities, different options for using reservation areas. Suitable areas is another um, potential tool. It's really where you say, OK, we have predefined areas that are really good for a particular use. This is really where that activity perhaps should take place, most of all, because it's most suitable for it. Here's an example from Namibia, which is developing its uh, marine spatial plan as we speak, so to speak. And they have used these prioritizations to designate primary uses, consent uses and prohibited uses and combine that with various zones. So you can see on the right hand side the names that have been given to the different zones, so for example, a fisheries zone. And in the fisheries zone, fisheries would be the primary use. So that's really what's given priority in that particular zone. And it means that all other activities 
can also use that fisheries zone as long as they are compatible with that primary use. So that would make them consent uses in that particular example. If, however, there's an activity that clearly isn't compatible with the primary use of fishing in such a zone, then that use would be a prohibited use. So that really just serves to illustrate the principle of designating priority use areas and then combining that with various other activities still, because it's very rare, given that uh, sea space is, is getting scarcer and scarcer, that you can give exclusive rights just to one particular activity. And this is how it translates into the first draft plan in Namibia. You can see these zones arranged on a map. And you can see that there has been a good attempt to actually separate them out, but there's also an overlap of uh, some of these zones. And that's why it's important to be very clear on what's the priority use and what are the other uses that can come in, but only as long as they don't impact negatively on the priority or the primary use. But plans, very often are much more than zoning. And it's important to not forget that um, it's not just the pretty squares on the maps that we're looking at, and that it's actually the plan's policies that are most important. So that's the instruments that are being used primarily, for example, in the UK, and here's England as an example. So the policies that are set out in the text of a plan, they really describe the means or the actions that are to be taken in order to deliver certain planning objectives. And they are applied as a package. They're not really applied in isolation from each other. And they are a mix, in the case of England, of strategic and spatially pretty specific policies and also of where and how some of these policies apply. And there's two examples of what such policies look like or sound like. So, for example, the planning guidance would be that land-based infrastructure which facilitates marine activity and vice versa should be supported. So the implication here being that if there is a planning application, if there is a developer saying, I'm keen to develop infrastructure, if this is an infrastructure that facilitates marine activity, then it's likely to be supported by planners, always, of course, given that all the required legislation is adhered to. So these planning policies come in various strengths and they come both in the form of more guiding principles and in the form of pretty prescriptive ones as well. So there is a difference between the ones that are pretty strong and the ones that are more open to interpretation and are intended to be more, more of a framework, really a guiding framework. And you can see that in the two examples given here. So here you see how that plays out in the case of England. This is one of the English marine spatial plans. And you can see really here the map that indicates where those planning proposals um, apply. And the example here is marine aggregates. So feel free to stop the presentation just for a second to read through these principles, the guiding policies that apply to these areas depicted here. Germany is another example. Germany has objectives and principles in its spatial plans for the sea. And the objectives, those really are the binding requirements for developing, organizing and safeguarding space. So those are the decisions or those are the objectives where it's already been decided what's going to be a priority, for example. And that usually translates into priority areas in, on a spatial planning map, whereas Principles, again, are slightly softer. They're really guidelines. Again, like in the English example, guidelines for the development of space. There hasn't been a conclusive decision as yet, but something usually has to be given special weight in decision-making processes. And that's usually what then translates into a reservation area in the German case. And again, just to show you the map to indicate how that plays out, the red ones, this is the draft and the first draft of the 2020 Maritime Spatial Plan for the German EEZ. And the red, dark red areas, those are the proposed priority areas for offshore wind. And the slightly less red, the hashed areas, the pinkish areas, those are reservation areas proposed in that first draft for offshore wind. And just to explain again how that then translates into the body text of a spatial plan, 
This is the example of shipping. That's the priority areas for shipping. Um, it explains that shipping is given priority over other spatially significant uses in priority areas for shipping. And it also says that measures, projects that are not compatible with the function of shipping priority are not permitted in those areas. So that's really the idea and it's really a very common way of setting priorities as part of the MSP. So I hope that's given you a pretty good idea of the actual spatial planning tools and the, you know, the things that really make MSP MSP and that sets it apart from other forms of marine management. So let's have a very quick look at stakeholder engagement um, as another instrument of MSP. And here in this presentation, I just want to point out that there are different degrees of stakeholder involvement, different degrees of participation in the planning process, ranging from informing stakeholders of the intention, for example, of um, planning, all the way to including stakeholders much more in the actual decision making concerning marine space. So it's really also a question of where do you put your stakeholders in terms of the authority you give to them and how do you consider them? Are they actually equal partners in the process or are they perhaps, you know, stakeholders that are important but that you just consult or perhaps merely inform of what's going on in the planning process? Moving on to scenarios as the last instrument to be considered in some detail today. And scenarios are included here because they are so useful as a tool for discussing different planning options with the stakeholders. They're really useful because they can promote dialogue and can also help towards consensus building because they help to create a visual picture of what might be of what might be different options, what could be considered as a planning solution. And it's a great way to actually consider alternatives, so different visions perhaps also of the future and their implications. And scenarios can actually also be quite fun. They can be creative, you can be imaginative, you can have, you know, you can have a lot of fun with stakeholders in scenario exercises as well. There's different types of scenarios and it helps to be clear on what type um, you are keen to employ before you embark on a scenario exercise. So the first is to use scenarios in an exploratory context. So that is what I was just talking about, you know, looking at what might happen, what might take place in the future. future. Here you actually map out different possible futures. Another way to use scenarios is to use them in a normative way to actually say, well, OK, it's kind of almost the reverse. You're sketching out a preferable future, so you know already what the vision actually is. You know that this is what you want to go for. And then you, you're painting different scenarios or you're sort of giving yourself different options for how we actually get there. Because there might be different routes to actually get to a specific end point, right? So you might, for example, consider a really participatory um, approach, or you might consider as an alternative a really top-down one versus the bottom-up approach. So different routes, how do we actually get to that preferred future? That's the normative way of using scenario. And the last one, the predictive one, is instead of asking what might happen, is to be a little more certain to actually say, well, okay, what will happen? So that would rely a little more on specific data, perhaps a sense of, well, we know actually pretty clearly what's going to happen already. Let's actually look at that in a more predictive way. Scenarios are not the same as forecasts. It's very important to be clear on that. Forecasts are much more reliant on data. It's what you use, for example, also in models. And you might, for example, analyze historical data in order to forecast what is very likely to happen in the future. That usually requires some quantitative and some technical skills. And it's very different from scenarios, which really mostly looks at variables that are important, relationships that are much more about judgment and about discussion and about what might be and not so much as what will be. And we've already seen that scenarios can take different formats. You can write a story, you can write letters, you can use postcards, you can do role plays in the more narrative formats. Or you can go for the visual format, you can draw pictures, maps, 
drawings, timelines, paintings, anything really that you can think of to actually depict those potential futures or pathways. Videos, you can combine them, of course, in any old way. There's no rules really as to how you should do a scenario, except that be clear what kind um, you'd like to do and how um, you are going to involve people and especially your stakeholders and uh, how you're going to guide your group or your stakeholders through that process. Just as some example, this is a nice example from Belgium. It goes back a fair way now. It was done in 2005 and it had exactly that intention to depict different potential futures for the sea in Belgium. The scenarios were given different names. So one, for example, painted a picture of the relaxed sea where the focus was on recreation and on tourism. Another one was called the playful sea, which was more about experience, about adventure. One was called the natural sea, where landscape, where conservation was in focus and so on. So you can see really the, the idea behind this of, of giving, you know, a storyline, giving a painting, a picture of, of what that would actually look like and pan out as. And that then, of course, can translate into different ways of looking at planning to then ask what kind of MSP would be necessary in order to achieve any one of these scenarios? What kind of trade-offs would be necessary in order to achieve um, this particular look for the sea? Here's another example, the North Sea 2050 Spatial Agenda on the Netherlands. That's a large scale visioning exercise that was done in the Netherlands to again paint a picture of what might the North Sea look like in 2050. That's a long way from now, right? But let's think creatively, let's think strategically. What might be happening in that sea by that point of time? What's going to happen with transport, what's going to happen with energy, what's going to happen with people, with fish, with the environment? What about climate change? How are all these different trends and activities likely to impact on the North Sea by 2050? So in 30 odd years time. This is another example, this time from Costa Rica, where again different scenarios were drawn up to reflect different sectoral interests, different priorities and also different conservation interests. So it's a good way of actually sitting down with different groups of stakeholders as well to say, well, OK, what's your ideal future? What would you really ideally like to see in 10 or 20 years time? And then to combine these different visions and to see, well, OK, where is areas of conflict? Where are um, objectives perhaps that, that cannot both be reached, where choice is going to have to be made? In this case, in Costa Rica, one was uh, ultimately selected. And again, if you want to look it up, please uh, feel free to Google it. Please have a look at the website there. We're coming closer to the end of uh, today's webinar. So I just want to point out the fact that when you think back to the planning cycle, we've only really covered um, instruments up to the point where the plan perhaps is then ready, where the plan is ready for implementation, what we haven't considered is the next stage, the actual implementation stage, and then also the monitoring and review stages that would come before there's a revision of the plan and the cycle starting all over again. So what I've done is simply given you some ideas of instruments that come into play at those later stages, such as the strategic environmental assessment, which touched upon already at the very beginning, also known in some countries as a sustainability appraisal, but also implementation guidelines. It might be worth considering what kind of guidelines or what kind of tools or what kind of handbook maybe can I draw up as a spatial planner to help sectors, to help other decision makers, to help licensing authorities, for example, or land-based planners to implement the new spatial plan. Is it possible to maybe draw up a simple checklist of what they need to do before when they consider a licensing application, for example, or, you know, some more precise guidelines, you know, what do I need to do if I'm confronted with a licensing application? Here's my marine plan. How do I decide whether this license should be granted or not? How do I use this marine spatial plan in practice? What do I do with it? Then, of course, other instruments are 
monitoring concepts. How do we think this plan and its implementation is best monitored? What kind of data is necessary for this? What kind of information do we already have, for example? What's already being monitored environmentally, economically and socially, for example? What parameters do we already have? Where don't we have any parameters? And evaluation strategies, a more conceptual approach, a more strategic take on, well, OK, how do we propose to actually evaluate this plan that we have drawn up um, and its effectiveness? How do we know it's really achieving what it's supposed to be achieving? So an evaluation strategy, another really useful instrument in MSP. And there are many more, like stakeholder engagement strategy, like specific guiding documents for sectors, workshops, meetings, conferences, all those things could also be considered MSP instruments. So I want to leave you today with some key messages in, in terms of MSP instruments. The first is that marine spatial planning really requires a lot of different instruments in order to succeed. Now, of course, it always depends on what you define as an instrument. But really, what we mean in this context is all the various things, whether it's a method or approach or a specific tool, that we need for the plan and for the planning process to succeed. And that includes, of course, primarily the spatial instruments. MSP is all about spatial management. So the spatial instruments, meaning those that guide how marine space is being used at the end of the day, those are really crucial elements of MSP because well, they really make or break MSP, I would say, at the end of the day. And those spatial instruments, they can be zoning, they can be pretty prescriptive in terms of you know, what should happen where in space with a ready-made map already allocating uses or combinations of uses, or they can be without those same prescriptive approaches. They can be more guidelines, like the English example we saw, the policies really taking centre stage. So the spatial instruments, that's the key but also the process instruments, all these various tools and instruments we have available to make sure that the MSP, the planning process as such, is a good process, one that is supported by stakeholders, one that leads to a good product. And we've also seen that different instruments come into play at different stages, while some of them apply all the way around the planning cycle, you can come back to um, and use, kind of take them out of their box, take them out of their drawer at different points in time along that cycle. So I hope that today has given you um, an impression of the diversity of MSP instruments, of the diversity of stages and also skills that are necessary in order to really do good MSP. And maybe the last thought to leave you with for today is that MSP really is teamwork and it's very unlikely that one person or even a small team would have a good enough grasp or overview of all these various instruments. So MSP really is all about bringing together a team and that also in fact includes your stakeholders, includes your experts, a team that is capable of not only using these instruments but also developing them enjoying them, employing them in a productive, in an effective way. And then also bearing in mind, like anything else in the context of MSP, that these instruments are also not static and it's quite okay and even desirable to continue developing them, to continue their evolution, so to speak, as the journey of MSP continues and as we all become more experienced and much better at understanding MSP and its various requirements. So that's all from me today. I hope it's been interesting and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you and bye bye.